Revelation 13, 11 through 17. I know that most of you are looking forward. I can't see that back there very well on that wall. <laughs> those, are, those letters are half as big as these letters. As we get older, we need larger print. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you'd like to follow on, along Revelation chapter 13, 7 through 11. Actually, one of my favorite chapters of the book. What did I say? Um, something else. Revelation 13, 11 through 17. You don't have to pay any attention to me. You just got to read the, read the letters here. Still one of my favorite parts of the book. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I want to read more, but we're going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say as I blame you. You said it was your, one of your favorite parts of the Bible. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, today's message is entitled, God wanted you to know. I could think of no better way to introduce this message because it's a hard message to, to, to deliver in some ways. But God wanted you to know. And when I say that, I'm speaking to you who are here in this congregation, but also to everybody who watches this on the video on, on the Internet. It's a message that is the third part in what we have talked about with the three angels. Es la tercera parte del mensaje sobre los tres ángeles. And we're on number three, as you can tell from the screen. We talked uh, last week about the three angels' message and how that it's encapsulated in the symbol of our uh, our denomination and I put a different one up here this week just so that you can see you don't have to take it for granted some people are, are can visualize it better than others but you can see here there's the world right in the middle of the of those three angels that are flying around the planet as they as the message proceeds from the cross from the Word of God the three angels and we've already talked about the first angel and how that it identified the the issue that will be at stake in this modern world in the end, and that is the issue of worship and worshiping the true God and identifying who he is, the creator, that he really did create the world. And there's there are layers upon layers of reasons why people today think otherwise. They've made different studies. They've grown up uh, going to school and hearing that the world came about by accident rather than by design. Uh, other explanations are applied to all of the other f features of the world that, that um, you can very well connect to the Bible, but they've heard these other explanations, and, and those are the smart people, the scientific people, and they've given the answers. And even within the church, they've pretty much accepted that that's okay. Um, the Pope has come out, one of the previous popes came out and said there's no difficulty between the 
um, mechanistic evolutionary worldview and the Bible, we just have two magisteriums. So you kind of divide things up and say, we've got two boxes. You've got religion and you've got science and the two don't come together in the same box. But if truth is truth, it should all be in the same box, right? It's all related. So I'm not going to go into archaeology or ge geology or, or any of those things we've talked about on previous weeks. But just to say, to acknowledge that that's where we are in the world today and that the issue of worshiping the creator is m never more relevant than it is today. El mensaje sobre el creador es muy relevante en este, en este mundo hoy. Now, when we jumped to the three angels' messages, there's a part of it that I skipped over. And I think it's essential. In your non-existent bulletins today, on the back cover, it asks the question. I left it at home. Sorry about that. We, <laughs> I left it in my Bible case, too. So I'll just have to off the top of my head. Um, on the back of it, I asked the question, where is Jesus in the three angels' message? That's crucial for us to understand. If we don't get that, then we've missed everything. You know, we're going to read about beasts, and we're going to read about persecution, and we're going to read about all those kinds of things in the message. And if it isn't, as the, the title says, at the, over the top of the book, well, actually, one says the revelation of St. John the Divine, but then in the next verse it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a message that reveals to us things about Jesus. Este mensaje nos revela cosas en cuanto a Jesús. Es la revelación. Now, it kind of gets missed in Spanish. They call it the apocalypse. The apocalypse, apocalipsis. But it's a revelation. It's an opening. Apocalypse is kind of like hidden things. But revelation is like, here's what's going to happen. God knows. God saw it ahead of time. He's not caught off balance. And so when we, we begin to, to read the book of Revelation from that point of view, it's a message of hope. Si lo leemos en esa forma, es un mensaje de esperanza. So let's drop back to the first verse of Revelation chapter 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Después miré, y aquí el cordero que estaba en pie sobre el monte de Sion, y con él 144,000 que tenían el nombre de él, y el de su padre escrito en la frente. And then dropping down to verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. Estos son los que no se contaminaron con mujeres, pues son Vírgenes, estos son los que siguen al Cordero por donde quiere que va. Estos fueron redimidos de entre los hombres como primicias para Dios y para el Cordero. Now what we have just seen is the picture of Jesus introdu introducing the chapter. How is Jesus introduced? What's the symbolism? ¿Qué es el símbolo? It's the Lamb. It's the Lamb. We have lots of songs that we sing about Jesus the Lamb. Tenemos muchas canciones que canta de, del Cordero. When John introduced Jesus on the side of uh, the River Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Cuando Juan introdujo a Jesús al lado de, del Jordán, dijo, He aquí el Cordero de Dios. And that was a, a marvelous announcement. That takes away the sins of the world. That's right. Because here he was appearing, and this is just his first introduction. But that's what he came for. He came to be the Lamb of God. And so in the book of Revelation, he continues as the Lamb. 
But notice what it said here in verse 4. I'm back up here in English uh, for those that need it. In uh, verse 4, it says, This group of people that are standing next to Jesus, this special group, follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Ellos sigan al Cordero donde quiera que va. That in itself is an ironic statement. Lambs are not known for being leaders. The lambs follow, but we've got to follow the lamb. And what does it mean to follow the lamb? It means to know what he's like, to be impressed by his character, by his love, by his mercy, his self-giving. You know, I was listening during the children's story and the response to, if you have something really good, can you keep it to yourself? And uh, Jack said, no, you can't. You know, if you, if you have something really good, you want to share it. That's, that's the lamb at work in us, that we're not selfish, but that we think about other people and share with them. If you've got good news, you want to share that good news. Seguir al, al cordero es hacer como él hizo y ser impresionado con su, con su carácter. And so they follow the lamb. Here's where Jesus is. And so the, the background for this message of the three angels is people who love Jesus, who want to follow the lamb. And so then we go... We've talked about the first angel. Now we're going to jump to the second angel. And here's what the message of the second angel is. Vamos a leer sobre el segundo ángel. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Otro ángel le siguió diciendo, ha caído, ha caído Babilonia. La gran ciudad, porque ha hecho beber a todas las naciones del vino del furor de su fornicación. The second message is about corruption within the system that is supposed to be upholding the truth of God. The corruption, it carries us back to Babylon. When you look at uh, ancient Babylon, Babylon took the sacred vessels of the temple and uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, when he captured Israel uh, or Judah, brought those to his kingdom. And then his grandson, Belshazzar, was going to use them to drink toasts to the false gods. It's a corruption of all that's good. Of course, that very night, he lost his kingdom. And Babylon takes the good things of the gospel and uses them for different purposes. We, we haven't talked a lot about Babylon. We haven't uh, used that, that symbolism. No hemos hablado mucho de Babilonia y el simbolismo. Uh, I would just suggest that you uh, get great controversy and read the 25th chapter this is based on, and you'll learn more about Babylon and, uh, and, and its connection. I want to keep on focus today, though, about Jesus. I want us to, to understand the message that Jesus has for us to understand. So when he's, he announces the fall of Babylon, we've got to know who Babylon is, and we've got to recognize that it's a, not a system to be followed anymore. Now we move on to the third angel. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, y el tercer ángel uh, lo siguió diciendo a gran voz, si alguno adora a la bestia y su imagen y recibe la marca en su frente o en su mano, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be t tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. El también beberá del vino de la ira de Dios, que ha sido vaciado puro en el caliz de su ira, y será atormentado con fuego y azufre 
delante de los santos ángeles y del cordero. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Y el humo de su tormento sube por los siglos de los siglos, y no tienen reposo de día ni de noche los que adoran a la bestia y a su imagen, ni nadie que recibe la marca de su nombre. There's a lot covered right there, isn't there? Um, it introduces symbolisms, uh, a beast, and then a mark, and worshiping this beast and his mark. And then it's a warning that says that if anybody follows the, the beast and worships the beast, as opposed to worshiping God, he will be tormented or he will receive the final destruction. El que adora a la bestia y recibe su marca recibirá también la tormenta que uh, es la destrucción final. Now let's back up just a little bit here. Um, well, okay, let me go forward here. I'm going to throw in throw some, the guys in the back a little tizzy here. On to uh, verse 12, Revelation uh, uh, 14 verse 12 here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus this is where this whole passage ends up here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus o en español aquí está la paciencia de los santos los que guardan los mandamientos de Dios y la fe de Jesús we already talked about in, under the first message that God's seventh-day Sabbath with it, that's in, in his commandments, the fourth commandment, has a special focus for these last days because it calls us to the one who created us to give him the worship that's due him. El cuarto mandamiento que con, eh, en que está el, el sábado tiene el enfoque de la adoración de Dios, el Creador, and also... It has the focus on, on obedience because we talked about that this is the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus leads us to obey. La fe de Jesús nos conduce a la obediencia. Now we've got different ideas about faith today. And we sing about part of the faith. You hear it over and over again on the radio. If you go to other worship services, we, we talk a lot about faith in Jesus and his death for us. And that's the, that is an important part of what, we're, what our Christian faith is. Without the cross, we would have no hope. But it is when we are one back to him and our hearts are one to him that we follow the lamb. And when we follow the lamb, we do as he did. We obey our heavenly father. We give him our worship, we give him obedience. Cuando seguimos al Cordero, obedecemos a Dios y lo damos nuestro Lord. And so we have this message, this is a call to the last people, and he's saying, if you worship the beast instead of worshiping God, you will experience the final destruction. Now notice it didn't say, it said the smoke of his torment ascendeth up. Back up there and, and take a look at that. El humo de su tormento sube por los siglos. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. This is a picture that's all through scripture. If you go back to the origin of it, it's in, in the book of Isaiah. And it talks about the smoke ascending forever and ever. And if we take it in a literal way, as many people have often done, they think that that means that that smoke never stops going up. And if the smoke doesn't go up, what does it mean? That the fire continues to burn. But what kind of fire does that? Fire consumes. Fire consumes. 
So it's not, it wouldn't be real fire. It wouldn't re be real smoke. It would be a mirage. But if we go back to Isaiah, we understand what it's talking about. In Isaiah, he talks about the destruction of a, an invading force. They come in and they burn a city and the smoke ascends forever and ever. What does that mean? It goes on and on and on. I was talking with my mom just this past week about a little um, misunderstanding that took place between uh, myself and, and our neighbor when we lived at the same house where my mom lives now. It, it seems that he was burning some leaves and um, didn't realize that he was burning on top of leaves that were on top of leaves that were on top of leaves, you know, down into the ground. He didn't, it wasn't all just burning on top of the ground. And so when he burned the leaves, it didn't just burn them up. It smoked and smoked and smoked and the smoke wafted its way over to our house and filled our house and I got a headache. And so I went next door and I said, is it okay if I put some water on your your fire. It looks like it's pretty much burnt out. And I kept pour, pouring water on it and pouring water on it and water, water on it and the smoke just kept coming up. Finally, the, the daughter came and she said, my dad says I th he thinks that you've put enough water on it now. But it just kept burning because the, the fire was consuming all that was there. And it was just kind of smoldering. When they would destroy a city, the, the smoldering of the, of the smoke would just continue. Even after the fires were out, it would continue to smolder and smolder, and they would say, forever. But there was an end to it. It just meant on and on and on. It meant that they didn't put the fire out. The fire does its job. Turn with me to John chapter 3. It's not on the slides, but you need to look at John chapter 3 and verse 16. Well, you don't even have to turn. You probably can just quote it. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. This past week I was invited to participate in a discussion about the fire of hell, and there are some other Christians who are looking at this again, outside of the Adventist, other, other Christian besides Adventist, who are trying to understand this, and there are different opinions, and I called their attention to this verse. This is the best, church, uh, the best verse on hell in the Bible. Este es el mejor versículo sobre uh, el infierno en la Biblia. But you might not know that. The word, it says that if we believe, what do we have? Life. Everlasting life. Yes, everlasting life. The promise is, if you receive him, you have eternal life. But what's the other side? If you don't believe, what happens? What's the word? Perish. Perish. Now, if you had a Strong's Concordance, you'd look this up, and it's Strong's number 622. That's a simple way to look these things up. Look it up in your concordance, and then you look in the back, and in the back, it's got numbers, and you look up 622. And you will find the entry under 622 using the word apolomai. And that's the same word that's used in Revelation to describe the destroyer. And, you will, and if you look it up over and over again, it was destruction. So what God says is, and, it, and, and that's the definition it gives there, utter destruction. Utter destruction. This, I, I pointed out that when Jesus was, uh, before Jesus was taken, they wanted to apolomai him. 
they wanted to destroy him. They didn't want to torture him. Pilate thought that might be enough. So he had him, out, had him beaten up and said, okay, behold the man. You know, is that enough? Are you satisfied? No, they didn't want to beat him up. They didn't want to torment him. They wanted him obliterated. They wanted him dead. And that's what this is saying here. The alternative to eternal life is not eternal life suffering. The alternative to, to eternal life is complete destruction. And that's the hope that God wants to give us. There are some other verses we could bring in that talk about destruction. They talk about um, uh, the, the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah when they were destroyed. And there's parallel passages that we could look at on that. But I, I like this verse right here. Because it's the promise of eternal life as opposed to utter destruction. So the, the smoke of their torment ascending up uh, is, is a symbolism that... Um, the fire doesn't go out until it does its job. It's complete. It's uttered and it's complete. And that's what he wants us to understand. He wants us to understand. Now, if for us to understand these symbols, then we have to kind of drop back a little bit. I have to go back. And we, we mentioned last week that Daniel 7 introduces four different beasts that are put together in a composite in Revelation 13 and calls it a beast. Now, uh, the word beast sounds really mean and ferocious. And of course, these are animals that are wild animals. But um, beast just simply means uh, an animal. You know, back in King James time, if you, you got on top of your horse, you said, I ride my beast. You know, it's an animal. So these are animals, but they happen to be, in this case, ferocious animals. And you look at the different parts of it, and, and you compare the two, and you see that Revelation is pulling together the whole of all of the prophecy of Daniel 7 that gave us Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then a divided kingdom. And on, when we look at this beast, it pulls it all together. And very specifically, it says that it has the body of a leopard, it has the feet of a bear, it has the mouth of a lion, and it has seven heads. Now, if you looked at all those four beasts in Daniel 7, the lion had how many heads? Just one. Okay. The bear, how many heads? Just one. Okay, that's two. The leopard had how many heads? Four. Okay, now we got six. And then there was another animal. It had how many heads? One. Seven heads. So all those seven heads are rolled into one. And then it says that one of those heads had horns, ten horns. Not all of the heads have the ten horns, but the one that represented the one that had the ten horns in Daniel has those ten horns, and those horns have crowns. Now that's significant. Hold, put that, tuck that away, because later we're going to look at it. Nos cuenta que tiene siete cabezas, y todos los animales de Daniel son siete cabezas entre todos, y que uno de las cabezas tiene diez cuernos, y que los cuernos tienen diademas, coronas. And that's significant. Now, what does a horn mean? What does a horn mean in the Bible? Anybody know what a horn is in Bible? Power. Power. Yeah. Uh, it's used in, in different uh, applications. But, you know, if you grew up on a farm, you know that the animal that has the horns is the one that's, that's in control, right? Because the horns give him power over animals that don't have horns. He can use those horns against them. So it becomes a symbol of power. But these, these horns have crowns. 
What kind of powers have crowns? Kingdoms. So it's, it's identifying for us the, the kingdoms. Now, one, what's that? Yeah, monarchies. Now, we're going to get to that, yes. So, as I was thinking about this, you know, I grew up hearing these prophecies, uh, and they were, they were always captivating to me because, you know, you see these images, vivid images of these animals, and, and uh, Bob, you grew up with these too, I guess, right? And, and so he, this is one of his favorite chapters, he said, you know, because these, these images are so vivid, they, they grab our attention. And when you look at Revelation, well, it's kind of a summary of what was in Daniel, and you could say, well, Daniel just came up with it, you know, uh, based on what he studied. Es posible que uno podría decir que uh, Juan uh, sacó las cosas de Daniel y los puso conjunto. But if you go back to Daniel, you can't look at it that way. Because Daniel gave those prophecies before all those events took place. How do you do that? Yeah. God knows the future. God gave this outline. It was because I had studied this stuff in, in school. Um, it gave me an outline of, of world history. And, um, and so history kind of made some sense to me. And when I went off to college, I took a test and didn't take world history because the prophecies of Daniel gave me the outline of history and I, I had hangers to, uh, to remember this stuff. So I, I didn't have to take the, the history course. Um, I thank the book of, of Daniel for giving me this. But it wasn't history in the book of Daniel. It was prophecy. It was God, the God of heaven, revealing to his prophet what was to take place because he wanted us to be reassured that he knows what's going to happen and he knows what's, what, where we will be in that experience. And we can trust him. Nos contó la, eh, la historia con anticipación para que tengamos confianza que él sabe. He is the God of history, the God of prophecy. So when we go to this, this, uh, this beast, we see the, the, the uh, horns on, on the top, and we see the crowns, and, and we see where he came from. He comes out of the sea. And if you look later on in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 17, in el capítulo 17 de Apocalipsis, it's going to tell us that water represents people. Que el agua representa gente. A big population of people. Una población grande de, de gente. And if we look at world history, we see where the populations were. One of the things that, I, uh, that, that, was, that clicked in my head when I took a world history class at, at App, I, I had studied some American history, and, and you know, we, what's, the, what's the story of American history? Westward ho, right? You know, we, we, they start up in New England, and then they, they start coming across, and there's a time when, they, oh, Michigan is the frontier, and then Wisconsin is the frontier, and, and then California is the frontier. You know, westward ho. Um, and, and so this, this western movement is, is the story of American history. But, you know, that's the same story in, in, in Europe as well, except that, in order for the for movement, people would they would establish themselves in some part of the country, and then they'd use up all their resources and they say, "Oh, what do we do? Oh, we'll go go take something from somebody else," you know. And so that's how the t ten tribes came in there and they took over Europe and took it back from R Rome. And pretty soon, though, it's all full. The neighborhood's full, and so where do we go? Well, let's take a boat. And we go to America. We got some more land. You know, oh, there's only a few people here. We'll take it from them, you know. And so the westward trek across the country, and now it's pretty much filled up until you get to those big open places out, in, out west. This beast comes from 
the populated area. It's Europe. But we come to another beast that comes from another place. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Wound. When did that take place? 1798. So when we compare what we've seen about this beast that, that represents the whole of, of uh, Western civilization, from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome and so on, it comes down to one of these horns, which we've, we are pre previously looked at, that pulled up three other horns, was wounded to death, and we've connected that to 1798 when that power that pulled up the three, which was in Italy, the Roman papacy, was wounded in a way that was, uh, some people thought it wouldn't recover. This was during the French Revolution, and uh, the General Berthier took the Pope ca uh, captive, and the Pope died. Now, some, you know, of course, there are lots of other Catholics to fill the, his place, but the church was at a very, very weak position for it to be taken captive. And as well, yeah. So, so Rome was no longer controlled by the Roman Catholic Church in 1798. It was not until Mussolini that a little postage sized stamp uh, piece of territory was given back for the papacy. It's a, a mile by a mile, I think, something like that. That's how big Vatican City is. That's all they gave back when it used to control most of the boot in Italy. So uh, in a sense, you could say the wound was healed. And in fact, that was, that was the headline on the newspaper. I've got a, a picture of it. But we're talking about when the wound took place in 1798. At this time, well, let me read it in Spanish for you. Y vi de sus cabezas como herida de muerte, pero su herida mortal fue sanada y se maravilló toda la tierra en pos de la bestia. Another beast comes up. I behold another beast. So we've got the time frame. Time frame is 1798. It's uh, how many countries came about in s around 1798? Well, maybe Australia. Uh, I don't know what other countries came up at that time. But 1798, well, we know one real important place that came up is this place, the United States. I beheld another beast come up out of the earth, not out of the sea, out of the earth, where, where everybody went when they ran out of land, <laughs> came up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and spake as a dragon. Después vi otra bestia que subía de la tierra y tenía dos cuernos semejante a los de un cordero, pero hablaba como dragón. Now, horns like a lamb. Horns like a lamb. Different kind of horns, you know. You got to keep your, your distance with a little lamb. You know, he could come up and poke you with that but he's not going to take on the whole uh, barnyard with, with little, little lamb-like horns. He's peaceful. He's innocuous. He's not scary. It's a different kind of a beast, a different kind of a beast. And notice, it doesn't say that his horns had crowns. No dice que sus cuernos tenían coronas. See, there's not going to be a monarchy here. You guys heard the story about George Washington after he, we, we gained our independence here, 1776 declared it and then fought that revolutionary war and gained independence. And then some people wanted to make George Washington, the general, the king, right? You've heard that story. And what did he say? No, I'll be the president. I'll preside over the government, but I won't be king. And so he was the first president. A whole different system. His horn doesn't have a crown on it. It's what we call republicanism. Now, those of you that are Democrats, don't get bent out of shape for that. We're, we're just, this country was called a republic because it was, it was shaped after the Republic of Rome and if it, with a Senate and 
you know, it, it was established rather than as a monarchy. So a representative gov government, and that's, you know, a bit complicated as we just had an election, but it, it's representative. You guys had a chance to throw, cast your vote, and those votes went through an electoral college and then elected a president. There's another horn there, though. What are the two powers that were at work through the uh, other animal, the other beast? Well, they had powers that were both political and religious. They had power. And the two horns worked together. If you didn't do what the church said, the church would talk to the state and the state would punish you. So there was a, th this um, league between the two powers and this new country would have separation of those powers. And that's the wonderful thing about the United States of America. We have that built into our Constitution that the Congress will not establish any religion. Now I'm pulling this to a close here with a quotation from NPR. I got it just yesterday. Yeah, just yesterday. Did you hear this? Um, our president was uh, visiting with the president of France, and they were asking reaction among the people. They had Bastille Day, uh, which is like our Independence Day, and um, they were celebrating it. And uh, they asked this one fellow, he's a delivery driver, Antonio Tavares, they asked him, uh, well, what do you think of this? And he said, I don't like everything America does, but they are the ones who keep the peace in the world. We've got to have America around. America has not always done right. In the prophecy, it says that America speaks like a dragon. Sometimes America does. Doesn't necessarily represent every person in America or every person that is uh, in leadership. But we are prone, being at one time considered the only superpower in the world, the remaining superpower, but we've got some other superpowers that are coming back up, that we were responsible for keeping peace in the world. Now, if I take this on, you'll have to put some pieces together. You're gonna have to see what it says that America is, a, is capable of doing and what America will do. I'll finish up with a quotation that is uh, from a writer that borrowed it from another writer. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to zoom ahead here. So guys, you have to jump up to the quotation. Protestants will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state. This national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. The protest of Bible truth will be no longer tolerated by those who have made not the law of God their rule of life. Then will the voice be heard from the graves of martyrs represented by the souls which John saw slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, which they held. Then the prayer will ascend from every true child of God. It is time, Lord, for thee to work, for they have made void thy law. The prediction that God wants you to hear is that there will come a time that those two horns will work in collusion in this country. And this country will violate religious liberty. And at that time, there will be a mark and false worship in installed. And it will be the will of the people. Unless we understand what the Bible teaches, unless we understand where the lamb has gone and follow the lamb, we will succumb to the pressures of society. This is a prophecy. 
So do you see it right now? Well, there are some who, who, who keep, keep their ear to the ground and they hear the rumblings of, of, of movements, different things. Uh, Jerry can speak up here and he can tell you about the, uh, the relationship of, of ecology to, to this scenario. Others can, can, can point you to religious developments. We can look in, in the world and see the power of uh, the people, which is, a, which is uh, given to them, but how that sometimes they're blindsided to see the rights of other people. And, and so that how that the will of the people, if we have a pure democracy, where that might take us. That's right. And so there's a connection between the two powers, between the first beast and the second beast. You can see I can't deal with this all today. Voy a leer en español. Los protestantes obrarán con los caudillos de la tierra para hacer leyes para restaurar la ascendencia perdida del hombre de pecado que se sienta en el templo de Dios como Dios. Esta apostesía nacional rápidamente será seguido por la ruina nacional. Tiempo es de actuar, oh Jehová, porque han invalidado tu ley. It comes back to Jesus. Do we follow the Lamb? Do we love Jesus? If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. Si me amáis, guardad mis mandamientos. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Pues este es el amor de a Dios, que guardemos sus mandamientos y sus mandamientos no son gravosos. It's all about following Jesus, not in some kind of general way, but obeying him. Not when it's just easy. That, that takes nothing. It's when it's hard, you know? The love that we have in our families is not seen when we do the stuff that's easy. It's when things get complicated, when things get difficult, when we have, have to, to do things that, that it's just not our natural inclination to do. But because we love our families, we love our, our, our parents, we love our kids, we, love, we do what we need to do out of love. And that's the test. Not when it's easy, but when it's hard. Like JFK, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. There's a challenge involved. But those who love him will hold on. They'll follow the lamb wherever he goes, because the lamb indeed is worthy. So let's sing praises to him as we finish our worship service. Number 246, worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Shall we stand? <clears throat> We're singing to Jesus now. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Glory, hallelujah. Praise Him, hallelujah. Millennium, holy Lamb, glory, hallelujah, praise Him, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, to the Lamb, the 
us may we each moment feel love him serve him praise him still till we all on zion's hill see the lamb glory hallelujah praise him hallelujah glory hallelujah to the lamb let's bow in prayer Lord Jesus, you are worthy of our worship. You have made us and you have redeemed us. Señor Jesús, eres digno de nuestra adoración porque nos ha hecho y nos ha redimido. We praise you and we give you our lives. Te damos loor y te damos nuestras vidas. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.